going to switch our focus a little bit here. We've been discussing bacterium that are causative agents of acute diarrhea. Now we're going to look at a protozoan. We're going to look at the protozoa known as crypto, excuse me, cryptosporidium. Cryptosporidium genus uh, has been known, shown to infect mammals, birds, reptiles. Um, so that's going to come into play later in this mini lecture when we discuss um, transmission. We are now seeing that this is more of a zoonotic infection to us humans because uh, we are exposed, um, cat, uh, was it cattle, pigs, chickens, other types of poultry like turkeys, you know, ducks. So we house them, we raise them on farms during slaughtering. There could be some fecal contamination of the resulting meat. Here's the problem. For the average patient who presents in a clinical setting with cryptosporidium, it's going to look like just diarrhea, headache, sweating, vomiting, abdominal cramps, not a major problem. Um, for most part, many clinicians are going to overlook it as a cryptosporidium and they're just going to chalk it up to you know, a viral infectious or maybe just E. coli, not one of the, you know, hemorrhagic or one of the high, highly pathogenic strains of E. coli. The issue is going to be for immunocompromised patients, specifically AIDS patients. AIDS patients have a very difficult time with cryptosporidium where a healthy patient or healthy individual, um, the infection could last a few days, maybe a week or so. For an AIDS patient, it's going to be chronic. Okay, They are never truly going to clear the infection. Actually, it, the symptoms can ebb and flow. They'll never truly go away. begins with the ingestion of an oocyst, okay? An oocyst is not an endospore. Turns out some protozoa can form a thick covering on their cell and go into a metabolically dormant state. These cysts, these oocysts, specifically here for cryptosporidium, um, are not overly protective. Okay. It protects them against drying. It protects them against, you know, slight changes in the acidity, pH levels. The acidity goes up, down, whatever. Um, but it doesn't make them heat stable like an endospore would. So you ingest a cyst, uh, fecally contaminated water or food, whether it's human feces, um, farm waste gets into the water, gets into the water table, somehow gets into um, municipal water source, which has happened, or you're out hiking and swimming and you get a mouthful of stream water. The oocyst goes through the stomach, passes through the stomach relatively okay, and gets into the intestines where cryptosporidium will exist. You'll exit the cyst stage, become a vegetative cell again. It attaches and penetrates the intestinal wall and then basically goes on a walk, on a walkabout, passing through different tissues, spreading, um, spread either through the lymphatics, the circulatory system, or through interstitial fluid goes through rounds of sexual and asexual reproduction, increasing the numbers in your tissues. 
um, for those uh, vegetative cells that are close to the large intestine, they will exit out or they will excrete a oocysts that will penetrate out into the lumen of the large intestine and out with the feces to start that life cycle again, either in the same host or a different host. Cryptosporidium is um, detectable in the feces. Take a sample of the uh, stool or the diarrhea fluid, send that off. They can test using fluorescent microscopy for cryptosporidium, or they can do an ELISA and test for the presence of proteins from. Um, side note here, you see the um, second major statement there. Um, outbreaks that are associated with swimming pools, half of them are traced to cryptosporidium. Somebody who is sick, asymptomatic, gets in the pool, out comes a bit of fecal material, a little bit of diarrhea in the pool, spreads in the pool you can't go swimming without getting some in your mouth okay it's just a fact of life whether it's a pool a stream a lake the ocean you're going to get some in your mouth we think that chlorinating the water in pools will damage if not kill all microbes and well no it can damage some but the chlorine levels have to be high which can be slightly irritating to some people. And as they treat with the chlorine, it's, um, const it has a lower evaporative temperature than water. So it, the chlorine levels are constantly dropping, have to be replenished. And in that up and down concentrations, some of the cysts are just going to survive. Cryptosporidium treatment, not usually required for healthy patients. It's something that given time, our immune system, our innate and our adaptive immune system will catch up and will remove it from our system. Whether it's in the blood, it's in the lymphatics, or it's in the interstitial fluid, just needs some time. If the diarrhea is bad enough, um, in a clinical setting, you can prescribe you know, either some over-the-counter antidiuretics or, you know, prescribe something a little stronger. There's really no true antibiotic, no antimicrobial to be taken for cryptosporidium. In AIDS patients, in truly immunocompromised patients, they will try what is referred to as Nitazoxanide. Nitazoxanide isn't doesn't work very well in the treatment and the removal of the oocyst that may develop once the um, cryptosporidium vegetative cells um, start reacting to a negative stressor. Um, but an AIDS patient. Uh, basically does not have an immune response. So basically you have to try something. And nitazoxanide is the only thing we have, even though it doesn't really work that well. Healthy patient, you know, or somebody who was healthy before they got the cryptosporidium infection, they got a nice good immune system, working immune system, time, fluids, um, maybe over-counter anti-diarrheal at best.